Because I've heard that yeah. Germany and Japan are the best places to go if you get a, a diagnosis of cancer. And what, so what makes these countries different in their approach to medicine? Mm -hmm. um, Germany, I've been to 15 times. Uh, Japan, I haven't been to yet. So mm -hmm. I, can speak, I can speak with some authority on the question of Germany. I'm going back again in November, uh, this November. Um, Japan, I know only from you know, discussions with Japanese doctors and from, from the, the literature. Um, ger the, the main centers for complementary cancer treatment in the world, um, I would say, are Mexico, Tijuana, um, and Germany. And each, in each of them, there's approximately 25 clinics that are actively seeking international or English-speaking or American patients, um, and with, with more or less success in, in attracting those patients. I very much, um, I mean, the, the Mexican clinics were the first complementary or alternative clinics that I ever experienced in the mid-1970s, but I... This is the Hoxie, uh, the Hoxie clinics? I've been down there, uh -huh. yeah. And there is, as I say, there's almost 25, about 25 of them, uh -huh. uh, and I've been, <clears throat> been to all of those, um, in, but I'm more and more inclined towards Germany for a number of reasons. One is that I think that the German doctors are very well trained, um, very well educated. Uh, the the treatment comes out of the soil, if you will, of of Germany. It's there's a tremendous support for complementary medicine in Germany. More more than 55 percent of the physicians say that they are either favorable or extremely favorable towards complementary medicine. A lot of them use it themselves or refer their patients to it. So I think, you know, that's a reflection of a deep um, affection that the, that the Germans and some of their neighbors have towards this sort of less toxic medicine. And so uh, most of the, the European clinics, Central European clinics, are busy treating their own patients, and the international patients come in as a sidelight, uh, whereas in Mexico, by and large, I, I rarely see Mexicans in the Mexican cancer clinics. Mostly, this is a, 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 pressure, a pressure valve for the United States, which has made it very difficult to, to get many of these treatments in the U.S., and so people go to Mexico to get things they can't get in legally in the United States. I know that you are a big proponent of therapeutic apheresis. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Is that uh... well? First, I wanted oh. to say that you know what's what's really characteristic of the German approach to uh, to cancer. They're not um, they're not hostile to doing you know conventional treatments, and they are well integrated. The complementary centers are well integrated with the local or the regional. Uh, cancer centers as a rule, but what they do add <clears throat> is a more of a immune uh, treatment. And what I mean by that is, first of all, hypothermia, uh, heat therapy, which is the one thing that I think is being accepted in Germany and elsewhere, and that we're uh, f lagging behind by several years in terms of uh, adopting. There is progress being made with heat therapy, hypothermia, hypothermia, some people call it on oncothermia, but very in this country, very slowly. Um, and and hypothermia, Germany, is it's not sitting in a sauna. This is something else, right? Correct. Okay. This is the use of, of medical devices, um, whether radio frequency or microwave, uh, that is used to deep, target deep tumors or superficial tumors, uh, local regional treatment, or else whole body treatment, which is another kind of hypothermia. And that's one, that's the main thing that I would say characterizes the German clinics, expertise and use of these kinds of heat treatment, often in conjunction with um, other treatments as well, uh, like chemotherapy, uh, not so much radiation in, in Europe, uh, although in the U.S. it's more typically used with radiation, and or other um, immune uh, treatments. The other, second thing that characterizes the German treatment is the use of mistletoe. Uh, mistletoe has been used medically in that part of the world for over 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. And 
And this is the, a common herb, right? That, well, that, it's a it's a plant that grows uh, in the tree. It is the same mistletoe that people kiss under mm-hmm. uh, on um, on uh, during the holidays. Um, but it's a very peculiar plant. It's sort of a um, a semi parasitic plant that grows. It's very very bright green throughout the winter. So there's certain mystical um, connotations to this spherical plant that grows. It's wildly uh, uh, um, uh, f- found in a kind of a wild profusion throughout great swatches of of European territory, and um, they make they ferment that and they 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 centrifuge it and they make it into a medicine called called Iskador, but it also goes by many other names. There's actually four companies in Germany that manufacture mistletoe products. And you and can't get those here in America; they're not sold dif- with great uh-huh. difficulty. Uh-huh. And difficult. and just tell tell I'm curious why because it's it's a plant it's non toxic so what right. what's the problem why is it not coming here? FDA won't allow it in and when uh, the few times that they've allowed it in they've blocked implement, made it very difficult for people to import it they've held on to it for you know beyond the expiration date on the product they've just FDA has just made it virtually impossible to get hmm. and they of course demand clinical trials and. The agent is not um, really profitable enough to undertake the costly kind of clinical trials that the FDA wants. In Europe, there have been clinical trials. My good, my colleague and co-author Joseph Boyt at the University of Cologne has done some of those, and so it's been proven to both improve quality of life and, in some cases, to extend life. Something like 55% of all German cancer patients are getting mistletoe. And in in Europe, it's funny because even people who are highly skeptical uh, of most complementary medicine, like Professor Boyd, um, don't consider mistletoe to be controversial or debatable anymore. So I would say that these two treatments, hyperthermia and mistletoe, are two things that could be added uh, here um, to beneficially to cancer treatment, but that's going to be a long time before that happens. So people are in this country are more or less, if they want those treatments, are forced to go abroad. You mentioned therapeutic apheresis. This is a kind of blood filtration that's used in Germany and Japan to treat dozens of different conditions. Like, for instance, very high cholesterol can be treated with therapeutic apheresis. It's basically a filtration. It filters the the blood, right? The blood, Uh and it can have a very big effect in cancer, much more than most pe- most people realize. I, I recently wrote a report at my website, cancerdecisions.com, uh, on this topic. Um, and I've looked at 15 cases of breast cancer, of, w- of whom 10 responded um, to the treatment. So I think it's a very promising thing. It has its, like all treatments, it has its pluses and its minuses. <clears throat> there are some you know, some questions about how long-lasting these responses or remissions mm-hmm. are. And, and the thing like this, the blood treatment, can is that done in this country, or does someone have to go no, again to Germany? It was, in, it was invented in this country, uh, basically discovered at the University of California, Irvine, mm-hmm. um, and then uh, for in a series of developments that the inventor of the treatment, Rigdon Lentz, left the U.S., in order to pursue greater opportunities in Germany. And he now practices in a small town in, um, in Bavaria, uh, and that's where it's available. It's actually, it is a legally approved treatment in the European Union. Now, Ralph- as I say, I, I, for anybody who's interested, there is a report at my website, Cancer Decisions, on that particular topic. Okay, now we've got two, uh, two minutes left. What would you like to leave our audience with, aside from g- going to your website, cancerdecisions.com, and checking out the Ross, uh, Moss Report? What, yeah. what would you like to close well, with? Well, I think before anybody undertakes treatment, they should, before they begin treatment, after, after they have a diagnosis, but before they have surgery, they should look into chemosensitivity testing. In other words, the tumor itself can be analyzed uh, beneficially to find out which agents are likely to kill it and which ones are not. And this is extremely important. There are over a thousand journal articles on this topic. It's been very unfairly condemned by the 
mainstream oncology profession, but there are some brilliant um, oncologists, especially in Southern California, who have made this into a, a, a viable and, um, and very beneficial sort of testing. You can improve the effectiveness of any drug and tell whether or not that drug is going is is likely to have any any benefit for you before it's put in your body. That's so fantastic. You can avoid right, toxic so drugs. Where so where can people get chem, uh, chemo sensitivity testing? It can be you can you can get it from uh, Ra Institute for Rational Therapeutics uh, in Long Beach, California. So the the website for that is rationaltherapeutics.com. Dr. Robert Nagorny. Okay, that's fantastic. And again, your website is um, cancerdecisions.com. Decisions in the plural, yes. 